Well, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you for joining our inaugural Wednesday seminar, Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar, which is coming to you in the virtual sense. Um, so thank you for coming along. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we are meeting today. Um, here in Canberra around the ACT region, it's the Ngunnawal people. But obviously, when we're meeting um, virtually like this, we have a lot of people all over the country, um, and, and dare I say, internationally as well. I'd also, so I'd like to just extend that acknowledgement for, for all the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today in Australia, but also all over the world. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and also welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be joining us on the webinar today. Um, before we kick off, I would just like to go through a little housekeeping um, about how this, this webinar platform will operate and, and how we're going to run things um, uh, moving forward. Um, so thank you for joining us. What you'll see is you'll have a panel available to you to chat and you can chat um, directly to uh, the, the administration, which is myself and, and others, um, or you can chat to everybody. So what we'll ask is we'll ask that you use that um, for questions. Um, we won't be uh, providing anyone with audio, audio capability to ask questions at this time, but we may explore that at a later date. I'd also like to flag that we are um, trying to always improve the Wednesday seminar and Geoscience Australia Distinguished GA Lecture Series. So to do this, we'll be providing a number, about five, five short polls, and I'll bring them up just before Nick starts. And what I'd ask is if, if, if you feel comfortable in answering some of the questions in there, please, please check the appropriate response which which suits you best um, we're all as i said we're always looking for feedback um, on how we can improve these wednesday seminars so if you do have any feedback may i please ask you send the that feedback to talks that's t-a-l-k-s at ga.gov.au and the coordination team will take those comments on board my name's chris lewis and i'm one of the people coordinating the Wednesday seminars and distinguished lecture series at Geoscience Australia. Um, other people in that group are Chris Nelson, who'll be acting as moderator today, Elizabeth Fredericks, and Robert Blythe, and Richard Blewett, oh, and Rachel Preslowski. So there's a great cohort of people. Uh, what I will do now is I'll quickly bring up the polls. Um, I'll pro provide probably about 20 seconds or so for everyone to read through the question and the, the responses and provide responses. So hopefully it won't take too long and I appreciate um, everyone's work, uh, everyone's uh, time on this. Great, thank you. I'm ending the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. The next poll will come up momentarily. Great, finishing the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. The 
the next poll should be coming up momentarily. Complete this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Two more to go. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Just closing off on that poll in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Last one. Thank you all again. Uh, Thank you. I'm just closing off that poll in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you all. <clears throat> I would now like to introduce our speaker for today, Nicholas Brown. And, and, and Nick is the director of the National Geodesy section here at Geoscience Australia. Nick's talk today will be about the Australian Geospatial Reference System and the, re the growing reliance um, to have a good solid georeference system in to support, <clears throat> excuse me, to support the, the, the growing use and reliance on positioning technology, things like your GPS. And this will have further implications around such industries as the autonomous vehicle industry. So I'd now like to pass over to Nick Brown to provide his presentation. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks for the introduction and um, thanks for everyone joining us on this digital, digital Geoscience Australia today. Um, as Chris mentioned, my presentation's on the Australian Geospatial Reference System. Um, I just want you to know, please don't worry if you don't know what a Geospatial Reference System is. Uh, this presentation, um, I've tried to design it in such a way that you, to help you understand what it is and help you recognise um, the importance of it and, and how we rely on this invisible foundation to position ourselves and align our spatial data. Um, and that's particularly important for the Positioning Australia program that'll provide you a little bit of information about um, in a few slides. So what is this invisible foundation that I'm talking about? Well, I like to think of it um, that people don't don't really understand it or pay much attention to it. And I think a good way to sort of sum it up was um, this quote from, from someone at Xerox who said that the, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everything, uh, of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. Um, and I think that is, um, you know, you can liken it to things like GPS or liken it to things like the internet where as soon as it's not working on your phone, you start to realise the importance of it and how much you rely on it. The Australian Geospatial Reference System, I consider to sort of fit into that category and I think you'll understand why a little bit more about that, about that um, in, uh, towards the end of this presentation, I hope. 
So as you see here, there's a, a rhetoric um, that goes around at the moment that everything happens somewhere. And it's, it's never been more true, I think, than it is now where so much of our data um, has a spatial association with it. And we, we have influence over a whole range of industries. It's no longer just a scientific endeavor. So I want you to use your imaginations. Yes, this is a grey slide. It's meant to be a grey slide, don't worry. Um, I want you to sit there and stare at the grey slide or close your eyes and have a think about um, what it would be like if you were picturing yourself stuck uh, in a fire uh, or in the or, or the surrounds of a fire. Some of us have had to deal with that uh, just this year and that's why I think it's a pertinent example. Some of the questions I'd be asking myself in that kind of low visibility if I was a firefighter are, where am I? Um, where are my friends or fellow firefighters? Where is the water near me? Where's the fire truck? Where's the fire front? How fast and in what direction is that fire moving? Um, and where are the houses uh, around the area? What kind of information would you like to have if you were stuck in that situation or actually trying to help people in that situation? Well, we at Geoscience Australia play a big role in helping to answer these questions. And I, I strongly believe we can play an even bigger role, I think, into the future in terms of making our, our data open and available, which we endeavour to do. So at GA, the data information we have is largely thanks to the great teams of, of things like Digital Earth Australia, who provide satellite imagery, uh, the National Location Information Branch, Community Safety Branch, um, and us here in, in the National Positioning Infrastructure Branch, which is delivering the Positioning Australia program. So we can provide this kind of information that helps people make decisions, uh, like what direction they should be moving in. Um, Examples of the kind of data sets that are valuable are things like water, um, roads, uh, where are they? Uh, where are the houses in the area? Where's the, where are the fires and uh, where are the fire units who are moving in that direction and, and how fast are they going? Where, when are they gonna be where I am? So when you see spatial data that's overlain like this, it, it's made to look like it's relatively simple to try and answer these questions. Um, but in reality, it's, it's not actually that simple. Um, so a, lot, a lot is taken for granted and the bit that sometimes is taken for granted is, is the foundation that all this spatial data sits on. So what, what is this? What is this box over here? What is this foundation that allows us to position ourselves and line up all this spatial data to help make decisions? Um, the quote that comes to mind when I think about um, this situation was from uh, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time where he says, a well-known scientist, some say it was Bertrand Russell, uh, once gave a public lecture on astronomy and he described how the sun, uh, sorry, he described how the earth orbits around the sun and how the sun in turn orbits around the va center of a vast collection of stars called our galaxy. At the end of the lecture, a little old lady at the back of the room got up and said, what you have told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. The scientist gave a superior smile before replying, what is the tortoise standing on? You're very clever, young man, very clever, said the old lady, but it's turtles all the way down. So a lot of people know this story and they, they think about the earth, you know, resting on turtles. Well, nowadays, I think we understand that uh, modern technologies prove that it isn't actually a stack, stack of turtles that it sits on. But if you ask me, it's even something more magical and more complex. And that is that we, Earthlings, we sit on the third rock from the sun. Uh, this sun's hurtling through space as part of an expanding universe. And thanks to gravity, uh, the Earth that we sit on follows the sun and also hurdles around. So we're going round and round and round. We're actually moving. Uh, the Earth is orbiting around the sun. And, and then when we go and launch uh, satellites, we've got satellites which are orbiting around the Earth, which are orbiting around the sun. And, th and they're making, uh, taking observations or capturing information, collecting imagery. And this data and information is collected on different scales. It's collected from different observation angles, from different altitudes, in different dimensions. Um, so it's actually quite complex, but we take a lot of that for granted. And the question is, how do we bring all that together consistently so that we can actually use that data to make decisions? So spatial data doesn't necessarily or inherently just naturally fit together. You need to make it fit together. And that's where geodesy comes in. So geodesy may be a word that a lot of people have never even heard of. Um, 
But what it is, is the science of measuring the shape, the orientation and gravity field of the Earth and how that changes over time. And here's an example of the gravity field. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between a very simple, um, what we call ellipsoidal representation of the Earth compared to the gravity field soon. Also, um, to talk about today is the importance of geospatial reference systems. It's, it's, a, it's a big term, but essentially what it means is that it's referring to the collection of datums, uh, infrastructure, models and standards that we need for four dimensional positioning. Without these accurate and reliable foundations of a geospatial reference system, we wouldn't be in a position where we can actually combine all this data together. So it isn't a turtle that we sit on, but it's actually the Australian Geospatial Reference System in Australia that we use as the authoritative reference system to position ourselves and align all that spatial data. And that's it's no longer just used for scientific purposes, uh, but importantly used for economic, societal and environmental decisions. Um, so my vision is that hopefully into the future, what we can do is uh, work with our counterparts in the state and emergency services sector to bring all this information to bear. So imagine yourself back in that situation now as a firefighter and you're actually able to uh, have this information presented to you in some sort of heads up display where you're getting information like the location of you and your colleagues, the location of trucks and helicopters, uh, location of the fire front and its speed. Um, and then using Internet of Things devices, you can be told how much water have you got left. Um, all this information can be put together um, and used for decision making, but it needs to be built on something and that's the geospatial reference system. So um, I suppose you could say, I like to use the analogy, it's not really the sexy part of, of finding solutions, but in my eyes, it's a very important part. So this is, uh, this is your Australian geospatial reference system. Um, we've recently been through a number of upgrades uh, to the geospatial reference system, and that's to reflect the growing needs uh, of high accuracy and reliable positioning for users. So some of you who would uh, most likely be familiar with uh, the geocentric datum of Australia. Um, that's essentially our standard, was our standard for things like longitude and latitude in Australia. We've recently introduced the geocentric datum of Australia 2020, and I'll explain what the need um, was to move from GDA 94 to move to GDA 2020. So we've been working, as you'll see, we've co-branded um, this presentation. It's a, a large part thanks to our colleagues in the states and territories around Australia. Uh, we're working uh, through the Intergovernmental Committee on Surveying and Mapping, uh, in particular the Geodesy Working Group, uh, to develop these new datums and also the tools and models that people need in order to access it or, or transform from the old ones to the new. So what I'll take you through first is a, a bit of a description as to why we've upgraded to uh, GDA 2020, uh, what kind of transformations are available to move your data to GDA 2020. Um, and then a bit later on, I'll talk about a new time dependent reference frame. So where the, the frame of reference is actually four dimensional, it's moving with the movement of the Australian plate. Um, and then a bit later on, we'll talk about height, which covers off on the components on the right hand side uh, of, this, of this slide. Altogether, these models, reference frames, datums, um, standards that underpin it, really go under the banner of the Australian Geospatial Reference System. Okay, so why, why have we upgraded the Australian Geospatial Reference System? What was the need to, to go through this effort um, and help people move across to new datums and new standards? Well, in, in large part, it's due to the fact that the geodesy uh, that I'm talking about is no longer an esoteric science. It's, we are mainstream and I like to remind uh, geodesists of that because they've never been more important than they are now. The traditional markets who used to use um, GPS or, or GNSS technology um, and are soon to make up less than 10% of where the chipset sales are going globally. And that's in markets like uh, the surveying sector and some parts of the agriculture sector, for example. As you can see, there's expected to be significant growth uh, over the coming years in areas like location-based services as people have uh, high demands for high accuracy on mobile devices. 
um, and also into the intelligent transport network. The Positioning Australia program that I mentioned before, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's, it was something that came out of the 2018-19 budget. Um, the Commonwealth Government committed $225 million to Geoscience Australia over four years uh, to implement the Positioning Australia program. And what it's essentially designed to do is to provide accurate and reliable positioning for all Australians. And so it will essentially provide you with close to 10 centimetre accurate positioning uh, as opposed to about the 10 metre accurate positioning that you currently get in your mobile device. So as you can see on, on, the, on the picture here, um, there's my, there we go. Um, so we have our satellites, um, let's call these the GPS or GNSS satellites that are transmitting signals down to some of our reference stations. We take that data into a processing and correction centre and we can deliver corrections to people uh, over the internet, which will bring that accuracy down to sort of that 10 centimetre level uh, across Australia and its maritime jurisdictions as well. And that supports a whole range of industries like surveying, agriculture, um, intelligent transport, aviation, maritime and location-based services. But if you're in an area where you can't get access to mobile phone coverage, you'll actually get a signal transmitted to you from a, a satellite-based augmentation system satellite. Um, so that means even if, even if you're not in mobile phone range, you can still get access to those corrections. So if we're going to have people with access to sort of five to 10 centimetre accurate positioning, um, to me or to the ICSM uh, and to the Geodesy Working Group about 10 years ago or even longer, 15 years ago, started working on the reference systems that we would need to support these kind of users, anticipating that this would be coming. So that's the, that's the main reason that we moved from um, GDA 94 to GDA 2020. The, the aim was to try and remove um, the, primarily the plate tectonic motion. Um, so the Australian plate moves at seven centimetres a year to the northeast. So between 1994, which was our old static datum, and GDA 2020, you're looking at uh, 1.5 to 1.8 metres. So if you as a user are getting 10 centimetre accurate, accurate positioning from GPS in your phone, your positions would be out by, you know, close to two metres in some areas of Australia. So we needed to update our static datum to be more closely aligned with GPS so that users wouldn't be on the wrong side of the road. You can imagine an autonomous vehicle using the wrong system. You don't, you don't want it to be on the wrong side of the road. Um, I won't go into the details, but apart from the plate tectonic motion, the upgrades uh, upgrade to GDA 2020 also removed a, a number of distortions that were known in GDA 94. And they, they primarily came in these distortions uh, due to the way that the uh, adjustment of all the data was done. We didn't have the capability or the technology to analyze everything all at once. So it was done in very hierarchical process, which means the way that we propagated uncertainty through the mathematical solution wasn't as rigorous as what we've done this time. Um, so in some areas, we've actually been able to remove some of the distortions of up to about 0.5 of a meter, which is fantastic. For those of you who, who love the numbers and want to go and have a closer look at this, um, first of all, email me because I'd love to meet you. That's, this is the stuff that interests me. Um, we've, this was all uh, gazetted or, or notified um, as part of the Commonwealth regulation. So there's a, a national measurement um, determination that, that says that at 109 sites around the country, um, the, this is the actual um, recognised value standard for position in Australia. So. Um, we have a document, you can see it's um, put together by the National Measurement Institute who work with us uh, to develop this. Uh, and we've got reference to all the sites uh, in Australia where we define uh, position uh, for the reference system. And then we use that to propagate coordinates uh, throughout the rest of the country. Okay, so now the bit that I wanna to touch on is, so where I've talked about the static datum upgrade. The bit I'll introduce here is um, the what we call a time dependent reference frame. So if you think about GPS, uh, for example, it's constantly updating and, and giving you a position based on where you are standing. And that position is relative to the center of the earth. So if you think about the Australian plate moving, every time you observe something in WGS84, you're continually moving and you'll be moving by seven centimeters a year. 
given that a lot of users want that kind of update and that kind of um, information in real time, uh, Australia has introduced this Australian terrestrial reference frame. So for people who want to be get a real-time position relative to the Australian plate and they're prepared to deal with um, the time dimension when it comes to coordinates, uh, you can use the Australian terrestrial reference frame. Importantly though, both ATRF 2014, this time-dependent frame, and the static GDA 2020, which is essentially fixing the Australian plate to its position on the 1st of January 2020, both of those can be used legally in Australia because if I take you back one slide, we'll see that in the gazettal notice we had in the legal determination of position, we have this bit here that allows us to apply velocities. So legally, we can apply velocities back and forth through time um, using a plate motion model. So you don't need to know the particulars, but you just need to know that they're interlinked and you can use either depending on what your user requirements are. So let's, let's imagine you're a keen Strava user and um, you wanna make sure that you're getting the most accurate running or riding times wherever you are. Uh, the Australian terrestrial reference frame might be the service for you. Um, it's going to give you sort of 10 centimetre accurate positioning well into the future in real time. Um, and th that's important, as I said, because the, these GNSS satellites that we're getting our positions from from space are actually delivering it to you with, you know, Strava on your arm um, as you're riding in real time in things like WG84, which is a time dependent reference frame. The corrections that we're going to be providing um, from the satellite-based augmentation system will be very much aligned to that. So you'd be getting your position in real time. So the way I like to think about it is you're giving users information in their datum. And in many cases, these users will want to be abstracted from the complexities of, of positioning geodesy. They won't even want to know what it is. They just want to just tell me where I am with respect to the Australian plate right now. So there's going to be many location-based services applications that are going to greatly benefit um, from the use of ATRF 2014. And we will update that Australian terrestrial reference frame to align with each of the new ITRF or the International Terrestrial Reference Frame Solutions. So the most uh, recent of those is ITRF 2014. When the next release comes out, which is expected to be ITRF 2020, will develop a new reference frame, uh, which is directly aligned with that. So the users won't see a difference. So here's a, here shows the, the model for the Australian plate motion model. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with what we call 14 parameter transformations, which deal with uh, reference frame changes uh, and the velocities associated with that, you'll see that there's a lot of zeros in here. And all you're actually um, applying are the rates in the rotations down here. Um, so you can implement those into software to move your coordinates between ATRF uh, 2014 and GDA 2020, or you can use software that we have developed called Geodapy. Um, so there's a range of packages out there on the ICSM um, GitHub website that'll allow you to implement those now. So here's just a bit of a diagram to try and depict the differences that I've been through. As you can see, uh, you've got GD, GDA 2020 here, which won't change in position over time at all. It's essentially fixed. Um, whereas the ATRF 2014 coordinates will continually change position as time rolls on. And you can move between them using this Australian plate motion model that we have developed. So it's horses for courses. You, you can use the datum or the reference frame that you like, depending on what your uh, user applications are. Okay, now we're going to have a quick look at the right hand side of this diagram here and we're going to look at heights. Um, and as I, as I often say when I'm particularly presenting to uh, uni students, heights are hard. And um, I'll try and give you a brief description as to why. When we think about um, GPS, what it's actually giving you is a position relative to the centre of the earth. And when we define the earth, we, we talk about um, geometric. We look at a very simple representation of the earth. It's very precise. Um, and we give, give you heights relative to the center of the earth, which can be translated um, up to here and called an ellipsoidal height. It's relative to this very smooth sort of representation of the earth over time. The problem with such a simple geometric representation and ellipsoidal heights is that water won't always flow downhill if you're using ellipsoidal heights. And the reason for that is because um, 
of the Earth's gravity field. Uh, the Earth's gravity field is more complex and it's harder to define, but it is a surface on which the water will always flow downhill. Uh, um, so if you're thinking about developing, a, let's say it was a massive um, water project somewhere, you wouldn't actually want to base um, water flow from one area to another using um, just the ellipsoid alone. You would need to take into account the Earth's gravity field because in some cases water can appear to flow uphill if you're only referring to uh, the geometric reference frame. This is why we need gravity, geoid models and the like. So what have we got in Australia? Well, if we look at the uh, geometric versus uh, gra gravitational potential, um, in Australia, what we use is um, our ellipsoidal heights here as shown in green. That'll give you a height above the ellipsoid up to your point here on the terrain. Um, you, would, you may have heard of the Australian height datum. That's the nationally recognised height datum in Australia. What we have developed at Geoscience Australia with assistance from our friends in the states and territories is a model to move between the ellipsoid and the Australian height datum, and that's called Ausgeoid. Um, so you can think about all the different um, user communities out there. We, we talked about the big beneficiaries of the Positioning Australia program. Uh, you're looking at surveying, uh, agriculture, um, the intelligent transport network, uh, and location-based services. The ones that I've circled here in green is because they have a subset of applications where using the ellipsoid and, and GPS or GNSS on its own is not going to be sufficient to meet the end user requirement. In some cases, like major construction and engineering, as I said, if you're designing a new water flow system, uh, irrigation across large areas. Um, if you're looking at major roads development, um, there's been examples where some of those have gone awry because the quality of our height datum in Australia uh, wasn't sufficient to meet the user requirement and they had, they had water running off into the wrong regions, which, have, which has caused problems for the road construction. Um, and also I'm thinking long into the future around if we were trying to provide advice to people on uh, tsunami, flood, um, and uh, providing warnings in areas like that. In, in those kind of circumstances, we actually need an improved height datum uh, for Australia to maximise the benefits of the precise positioning so that if a user's out there collecting GNSS information, they can have that ellipsoidal height information translated into a height uh, which is useful for the purposes they need. So one of the main restrictions, as I said, is that the, the height datum that we use in Australia, the Australian height datum, uh, was based off mean sea level, close to mean sea level observations back in the 60s. Um, and so mean sea level doesn't accurately um, represent water flow either. So we have a whole range of complexities, which means that the, the model that we're using to convert between ellipsoidal heights and the Australian height datum in Australia um, is only accurate um, to about eight um, to about eight to thirteen centimeters across the country. So if you think about some of the applications where users are going to need to convert their very precise, um, let's say in areas where they've got mobile phone coverage, they're getting three centimeters out of a mobile um, mobile device. If they try and convert that height into something related to gravity, so they can use it for water flow applications. Um, they're going to incur a further 8 to 13 centimetre inaccuracy. Um, so we're actually reducing the quality of the result for that user base. For that reason, what we've done uh, recently, we've, we've undertaken a few projects with our colleagues at uh, Curtin University and also um, our, and our state and territory colleagues uh, to develop what we've called the Australian Vertical Working Surface. And essentially, it's an updated version of the gravity data that we've used in the Ausgeoid models. And we've removed a lot of the bias and distortion that's come in through the um, Australian height datum uh, levelling data set, which was collected almost 50 years ago. And so using the Australian vertical working surface instead of using um, the Australian height datum via Ausgeoid is you end up with a much smoother surface, which is going to be very useful for large scale uh, environmental projects. So we've, we've been looking at applications like um, LIDAR um, where it'll, and remote sensing and environmental monitoring, um, where in some cases at the moment, for example, the major road construction I told you, they were trying to combine uh, using leveling data with GPS data, drone data, 
Um, and what they were finding is they couldn't actually tell if error was in the data or in the datum. So was error in the data they collecting and the way they were trying to make it fit together, or was it actually in the Australian height datum? And in many respects, it was in the Australian height datum. But because they had a reference surface that wasn't accurate enough, uh, they couldn't actually resolve the problems. So we are hoping that um, more and more people will start to use the Australian vertical working surface uh, for particular large scale studies where they want water to flow smoothly. And as you can see, um, the major benefit of using the Australian vertical working surface over Ausgeoid to get to AHD is that in, an improved accuracy. In, in the worst case scenario, you're looking about eight centimetres of, of, of uncertainty across Australia as opposed to 13. And what we would say is that we, we can also get that down to about one to two centimetres where we're never going to be able to do that due to errors in the levelling data associated with the Australian height datum. We get down to that one to two to three centimetre range with the Australian vertical working surface by including more terrestrial gravity observations um, and importantly airborne gravity observations. And in recognition of this, we've got a collaboration going with our friends in Victoria at the moment where we're soon looking to capture more airborne gravity data across Victoria. And they were able to source the funding based on the fact that it was going to improve the height reference system in, in their state um, and further enable more applications for precise positioning directly from GNSS, convert those heights into something in which water will flow accurately downhill. And it, essentially what it's doing is increasing the number of applications they can use precise positioning for. So this is a real, a real coup for us at, at GA to be able to work with Victoria and improve their height reference system. And, and we look to try and work with some of the other states and territories to do this in the future. A good example that comes to mind, um, and we have been chatting with, our, with um, uh, some people at the Snowy Hydro Authority, for example, uh, you look at how Snowy Hydro was developed um, back, back between the sort of the 50s and the 70s. Um, they built uh, nine hydroelectric power stations, 16 dams, about 225 kilometres of tunnelling and pipelines. It was the largest engineering project ever undertaken in Australia. And you look at um, some of the surveying and the, the, the difficulties in the techniques that they had uh, to try and capture the, that information at the time. That's not how we would try and capture that information now. So if you look at things like Snowy 2 that they're looking at at the moment, um, they're looking at 27 kilometres of tunnels and pipelines. It's a almost $4 billion project. What do you think would be the most suitable height datum uh, to use for heights in that area? The recommendation that I've provided the Snowy team is that AHD uh, alone is probably not going to be the most efficient or accurate way to do it because they're likely looking at integrating GNSS, uh, leveling data, INSAR, LIDAR, drone, satellite imagery. Um, and I think these sort of, this is sort of the largest scale project that I'm aware of at the moment, but I think these kind of projects are gonna be more common. They may not have the same budget, um, but they are gonna become more common into the future. So. I think that Australian vertical working surface is going to be extremely helpful uh, for those type of applications. All right, now on to standards. Now, when you talk about standards, this is normally uh, the, the kind of look that I get. Um, but I think I increasingly want people to recognise that um, this, this kind of a, the standards party is a pretty big deal. Uh, to me, this is going to be the thing that sort of cuts through and allows us to apply all the benefits of the Positioning Australia program to the widest range of users. And the reason for that is because the current um, standards and formats that we're, we're using in the, in the world of geodesy, they're not gonna adequately serve these non-geodesy users into the future. As, as I mentioned before, we're almost uh, revitalizing the user base of who uses our, our data and our products. And so we need broad multi-domain standards um, that are useful for combining the precision in the geodetic data we have with information from other domains. So the, I suppose a, a difficulty we have in being such a foundation for so many applications is that we need to make sure our data can be integrated into all those applications. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, internationally, there's, there's a number of groups who are working on defining these standards for geophysical and, and geospatial data. Um, but there's no real international strategy out there at the moment to make sure that the geodetic data is gonna be findable, 
accessible, interoperable and reusable, which is a, a growing word within the standards community. We need to make sure our data is fair. And if it's fair, um, we then ensure that most people can pick it up and use it. So um, we've, I'm very excited. Uh, to me, this is the party, as Ron Burgundy would say. Um, we've been working very hard with people like uh, uh, Dr. Ivana Ivanova from Curtin University. Um, and the team at Frontier SI, what we've actually done is we've started to do these case studies where we're saying, okay, what are gonna be the key requirements for each of these new sectors, like agriculture, for example, here? We've gone through and worked out what their requirements are in terms of accuracy, availability, integrity, coverage, reliability. We then looked at the standards that support those kind of um, requirements. Uh, we've identified gaps in the standards and then we've identified where we need to have necessary improvement. And we're looking to continue to work with um, these, particularly with the industries themselves to test whether or not the solutions we're coming up with are gonna work. Um, but then also investing time with uh, ISO, OGC uh, and, and the big players in the standards community to make the changes in the standards that the users will ultimately need. The, the last thing we would want is for us to be able to make open and available this great positioning service and people can't actually use it uh, for the way that we would like them to use it. So this carries across all the sectors that I mentioned before. Here's just another example of road sector where you can see that they're interested in things like authentication and interoperability, and they have different requirements for positional accuracy and timing, uh, cuts across different standards that we need to take account of. So this is a large scale problem um, and what we're trying to do at the moment is articulate the problem and, and then start providing information to some of the, to the community so that we can uh, try and tackle it together. Recognizing we can't do it alone, um, this is sort of my bit of a mind map to show that you have uh, UN organizations, for example, the UN GGIM Subcommittee on Geodesy. You've got the uh, International Association of Geodesy, uh, International Federation of Surveyors, you've got ISO, you've got OGC, you've got GEO, you've got all these groups out there who are currently looking at uh, standards work and gaps in standards. Um, the aim that I would like to make is to try and get these groups working together on, this, on the problem. So we could identify all the work packages and get them all to start delivering small bits of that. And I, I'm involved in many of these organizations and, and I'm looking to try and um, make sure we've got the efficiency in the way we're tackling this problem. The aim is that we, um, we then have these standards communities and the standards available to get down to the uh, industries, research communities, solve some of these unknown gaps and make sure that by the time we get down to the end user, we've filled all the gaps and in many cases, we can make them as open as possible. Here's one example of some work that we're doing. Um, it's called Geodesy ML. Um, it's a proposed application schema uh, for GML or the geography markup language. Essentially, we're looking to bolt this on to GML so that um, it applies to the specific uh, geodetic applications where GML currently doesn't have, uh, for example, a field uh, for the metadata that we need. Um, so we are looking to work with ISO and OGC and, and continued development of Geodesy ML um, to try and tackle some of these problems. Uh, we also have big involvement within ISO and, and the EPSG community to make sure that when, when we introduce new datums and models to transform them, um, that we have everything in place so that it, these EPSG codes, for example, end up in the software or in, or in PROJ uh, so that people can go out and do the development that they need. So um, take note of all that. There'll be a test at the end. Kidding. Okay, now the final point that I wanted to make is that this really is not something that only us in Australia are passionate about. Um, in recognition of the importance of geospatial reference systems, what this presentation is about, in 2015, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution entitled a Global Geodetic Reference Frame for Sustainable Development. This, is, this was a, a very big moment. If, if anyone who knows the UN process, you'll know how difficult it can be to get a general assembly resolution passed. Um, importantly, it was driven a lot by developing countries that, that we do work closely with. And it was in recognition of the fact that Australia and just like developing countries, they need a reference system that are gonna allow them to tackle problems like uh, climate change, uh, meet their requirements under the Sustainable Development Goals, 
uh, address the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. This, this geospatial reference system needs to be accurate and robust um, in order for them to be able to answer these questions and to try and solve some of these key problems that they have. Okay, my final slide. Geodesy is no longer an esoteric science, it is mainstream. Geodesy and the geospatial reference systems provide the foundation for good decision making. Uh, the upgrades that we've made in, a, in Australia to our geospatial reference system, they are required to meet the new and emerging needs um, and make sure that users can maximise the benefit of the Positioning Australia program. GA don't do this alone. As I said, we collaborate very closely with our colleagues um, through the states and territories, thanks to ICSM. Um, and in, importantly, through international communities like the UN, uh, IAG and FIG, and, and they're keen. And we look to continue to work with those communities to not only improve our Australian geospatial reference system, but to make it open and available so that we develop the tools and processes uh, that we can hopefully give away um, in, in a very open source way uh, to developing countries as well, to really deliver what that UN resolution was trying to achieve. I'll thank you for your time and I'll pass you back to our moderators now to see if there's any questions. Thank you. I, I can I can hear the applause, Nick. Thank you very much. <laughs> for your resonating through the headphones. Um, look, there, there were there were some some questions that did came through come through the Q and A. Um, Nick, I'll encourage you to just pop those ones up. Um, if you can on your tab, but I'll I'll run through these through the moderation channel. So one of the questions came from Andy, and Andy was asking, what is the vertical in the AVWS? Now I, I, I pause because Andy did follow up on this later, and he he asks uh, or he states rather, I was actually wondering about the semantics. It occurred to me that it that it is the working that is the vertical, whilst the reference surface itself is more like horizontal. There you go. Um, does that does that pose a solid question to you, Nick? That you feel you could answer? I'll I'll try. I'll try. Um, so the the term um, working surface. I might tackle that bit first, and it's actually those two words that go together. It's kind of the um, terminology that's that's been used um, globally, um, working surface. That is to try and describe. Um, uh, a surface that you can use that accurately represents height, uh, but we use the term working surface instead of datum because datum in many respects implies legality. And uh, it's an important distinction. The Australian height datum that we use at the moment is still the Australian datum in a legal sense and, and used for property boundaries um, and, and a lot of construction type projects. So we're not looking to upgrade or update the legal datum yet and that's why we use the term working surface it just becomes an alternative that people can use if they'd like to try and use it great thanks nick look if that if that answered the question awesome if, if not i'm sure you can follow up with with nick directly um i recognize that richard asked a question um around uh why doesn't water flow following mean sea level there was a there was a response that came out from jack but that's subsequently been removed um so so nick are you able to sort of expand and why why doesn't water flow following mean sea level uh so the difference between what i might do is i'll go back to a slide i've got here which might help answer richard's question hang on a tick <coughs> All right, so what you can see here is the Australian height datum um, is very, very similar to mean sea level. It's effectively what mean sea level was estimated to be back in the late 60s. Um, but it is no longer closely aligned with that because of things like climate change. We've got sea level rise, for example. So um, mean sea level doesn't exactly coincide with the geoid though because we're getting into some physical geodesy here. Um, stick with me. <laughs> um, because of the difference in the density of the water. So if you think about the way that the mean sea level was realized, you'll see it in this picture here. 
what what they did is they actually took mean sea level at all the different tide gauges around the Australian mainland. They did Tassie later on, um, and they held them fixed. But because the warmer up uh, the water up here in northern Australia is warmer than southern Australia, you end up with this trend between mean sea level and the geoid. So the gravity at up in the north and and down here might be the same, but because the water is warmer, water molecules uh, get further apart. You end up with sea level that's about a metre, uh, half a metre above the geoid up here in northern Australia, and about half a metre below down here in southern Australia. So mean sea level and the geoid are very similar, uh, but they're not exactly the same, and that's why we have a, a distinction between mean sea level and geoid. And I hope that helps. If it doesn't, Richard, please feel free to come and find me and I'll, I'll, we can draw a diagram. Great, Thank, thanks, Nick. Um, there is another question in here. This one comes in for, from Paul and it, and, it, and it perhaps follows on a little bit from Andy's question. How will AVWS be implemented? For application in software, will it be a geoid file, NTV2, or a transformation set? Yeah, great question. Um, so at the moment, we have it made available in uh, GeoTIFF format. And, and Jack, who's been helping to answer some of these questions, is actually the Brains Trust uh, who puts a lot of those uh, files together for us, which is great. Um, so yeah, we have them as a GeoTIFF um, and they're available through the GA website. Um, but we are also conscious that some other people would pr probably prefer them provided in different formats. Uh, if you have any um, requirements for that, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, let us know what kind of work that you're doing and what kind of file type you'd need. Um, and then Jack and I can, can help you um, with your particular inquiry. Uh, one other question's just popped in. Give me a moment to read that one. Okay, so this one comes in from John. The tide gauge, tide gauge data from around Australia shows slowly rising sea levels since records began. How is this impacted by changes in the geoid due to tectonics? That's a that's a big question. So um, I can't comment on the tide gauge data from around Australia because I haven't actually um, had a look at that, but I would I would expect that it is rising, which matches the satellite altimeter record. Um, around Australia, it varies but varies a bit, but it's sort of around that three millimetres a year mark from the satellite altimetry data I've seen. Um, how is this impacted by changes in the geoid? Okay, good question. So what can happen is you can have, there, there's some research out there at the moment which is showing that changes in sea level may cause changes in the geoid um, because you're getting water moving to a different area, which is pushing the plate down, and you, you may then see that reflected uh, in the change in gravity. Um, it, th to be honest, I think it's still quite an open question. There is a there is research going on that topic at the moment, um, but there there has been some evidence to show that they think that could be happening. So you could get a downward pressure on the plate uh, from extra water moving into a particular region. Thanks, Nick. Um, another question here from Mahesh, and apologies, apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Could you give a status update of the Global Geodetic Reference Framework for height? Yeah, there's there's been a bit of an international push on this um, over the last 10 years or so. Um, Australia has been providing information into this. Uh, the major beneficiaries of people who would benefit from a global uh, geodetic reference frame for height. So they're calling it the unified height system. Um, uh, probably people from countries, we have bordering countries with people, we have different height datums. Australia, we're not, we're not largely impacted by something like this, but Europe, for example, I think could benefit from, from projects like this where they're looking to unify the height system. Um, at the moment, that if you want a status update, I was at the IUGG meeting um, last year and there, there is a working group dedicated to looking at how you combine all this data together. Um, and they're, they're always looking for people involved as well. So Mahesh, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure they'd be keen to have a chat with you about being able to be involved in it. Um, they've got a range of work projects they're looking at the moment. Um, they're concentrating on things like what do you define as the, as the reference surface for gravity? Uh, what kind of height system do you use? Use a normal height system or a normal orthometric height system, for example. So they're looking at all the different um, 
theoretical aspects of the height system. And um, and as I said, they're looking for more and more people to get involved. It's, a, it's, it's an open working group within the International Association of Geodesy. So if you'd, if you'd like me to put you in touch with Laura Sanchez, who's head, heading up that, um, please feel free to get in touch with me um, via email. I'd, I'd be happy to put you in touch. Great, thank you. So that will be the last call. While you're all frantically typing away to be that last, uh, sorry, that's the last call for questions. While you're, while you're frantically typing away, I will just um, highlight a couple of things coming up. Um, these, these Wednesday seminars and DGAL series will be recorded and we'll be looking to host those on the Geoscience Australia website for you to view at a later date or if you miss subsequent uh, seminars. Um, I would like to I would like to just flag that uh, there will be no Wednesday seminar next week for Geoscience Australia. We'll be having our mid-year forum, so those of you, the employees of Geoscience Australia, please attend that forum at 11 o'clock next week. I would like to also raise that on the 1st of July, that's the following week on Wednesday, Dr. Chendra Oja will be presenting groundwater monitoring in California in the California Central Valley using INSAR and GRACE remote sensing. So please come back in two weeks time for that next presentation. Um, I, have, I can't see any more questions coming in so I'd like to thank Nick again and I can, I can, I can hear the applause again. Um, so thank you Nick and thank you everyone for joining us and as I said if you have any feedback or follow-up questions please send them through to talks at ga.gov.au. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye all.